important to us in society uh, and how we begin to build a more build bridges into, into new spaces and new knowledges. Um, so one of the people I admire is um, Judith Butler, and she's been quite instrumental in, in shaping and rethinking what we mean by gender, gender and identity politics. <laughs> and something I enjoy about her work is her sense, her, her re her re um, conceptualization of performative, the way that we sort of act, do, behave, and how that presents our gender or our, um, yeah, our, our sense of um, being in, in, in relation to others. Or becoming, I should say, really, it's really a sense of evolving and becoming. I think that that maybe marks a shift in lots of ways that we'll hear about, um, uh, you know, uh, how we are in a process uh, and how these, this process can change social values. Um, so I'm really honoured to host, uh, you know, three distinguished speakers or four, in fact, uh, distinguished speakers um, who will be able to discuss this in much more depth than I ever could about the concepts, um, uh, you know, through this prism of LGBTQAI plus uh, narratives, uh, particularly from marginalised uh, perspectives. Um, so Sanjini Kedia is going to present some groundbreaking research on trans men's experiences in India uh, and the UK, I believe, um, highlighting the transformative role of dance movement psychotherapy uh, in fostering mental health and emotional well-being. So as, as I understand it, um, her work advocates for queer affirmative therapeutic practices, um, challenging some of the traditional modalities and redefining the therapist ally dynamic. So I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, Dr. Jessica Collier, uh, a colleague in, in CNWL, is going to share some of her innovative um, work um, that intersects art psychotherapy with feminist criminology. So her insights into lived experiences of LGBTQAI plus individuals in incarcerated settings are going to shed some light on the unique challenges they face, um, underscoring the transformative power of art psychotherapy. Um, a colleague at Brunel University, Dr. Ivan Jarina, um, alongside emerging game designer Zander Vermas, um, they're going to explore the digital landscapes um, and looking at identities in gaming. So their discussion on the impact of digital media on cultural narratives and the construction of queer identities within virtual environments promises us uh, uh, a nuanced understanding of, of um, how we represent uh, identity and identity formation in a digital context. Um, so I'm hoping that through these presentations, we begin to kind of cultivate a more inclusive, holistic uh, dialogue, discourse, uh, understanding of LGBTQAI plus experiences, um, hoping that we'll champion together a more inclusive, affirming approach to, to the arts therapies and arts based practices, uh, digital media, creative expression. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that we sort of do this journey uh, you know, through collective understanding, that we have some dialogues around this. There's going to be um, opportunities for questions, uh, explorations, comments, um, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of building new dialogues. So welcome, all of you, um, and thank you speakers today for, your, for agreeing to present. Um, uh, and so I'm going to hand over back to Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Um, yes, Thank just you. to say before before Sanjini um, takes over, just for those of you online, if you want to get some paper and some art materials, because Sanjini is going to do something experiential with us, um, and we have that here. So just to give you a, just a couple of seconds to race around your flat <laughs> and get some what, just paper? Yeah, just paper and colours or whatever, whatever you find. Just whatever art materials, even just basic, basic pens and paper. Yeah, okay, fine. so just give them a few yes. seconds and then you can prepare yourself. Switch off the camera here. Yes, because there are too many cameras. So what we're talking about right now, <laughs> in case you're wondering, is that we have uh, an unusual screen at the moment um, and we're just trying to figure out how we can see you because at the moment we just see the presentation waiting to load um, and we're just thinking about that. And I'm wondering if I can ask Pierre to help us. <laughs> Do you know how we can get this screen with the Zoom behind because Davide has got this and we can't see all the people. He, he is, yeah, through the computer. Do you have it there? Yeah, I might be able to help uh, you. Are we using Teams? Yeah. So just give us a second, uh, and hopefully then we can see you as well as you being able to see us. Oh, that's totally good. Yeah. 
It was on when we arrived. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just to say, we'd like to take a few photographs. I did take one. I'm happy to delete it if anybody doesn't want to be in a photograph. It's just to record the fact that these have happened and to, yeah, add to the website. Can you not do it when the lunch really? Yeah, I'm definitely. Yeah, yeah, I'll choose those ones. Okay. But yes, if you yeah, just whisper in my ear or just give me a little gesture and I'll make sure you're not in it. We're still working out the, the screen. Uh, sorry about that. It's just frozen and for the moment. Are sure that it will, you do, your ex will do that left control the other one, right? No, this one. This one, it will This is. Oh, okay. okay. And now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, just to add to the notes. Yay. Yay. Okay, we can see you. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. What should I do now? Now you need to share the presentation. Oh, yeah. No. That's very important. <laughs> Minor. Just to say the people uh, in the room right now. We'll actually be doing reflections on the bigger paper, so we actually wouldn't need oh, this, but it's fine. We we can see how our bodies feel then, okay. and whatever we wish. Yeah. Yes. And then. Oh. That's the thing. Because you're illustrating on the same. Okay, are we ready? Yeah, I think so. You're looking good. Yeah, looking good. Sanjini, take yes. over. <laughs> can everyone hear me? Just can you give a thumbs up so I know? Perfect, fab. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I'm Sanjini Kedia. I'm going to keep rotating so everyone can see me. <laughs> um, so I'm Sanjini Kedia. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a registered dance movement psychotherapist, a queer affirmative counseling practitioner, and a PhD candidate. Um, next slide, please. Um. <laughs> the, the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. The center to the margins, the margins to the center, the center and the margins. What is at the center of the society? The patriarchy, a system that legitimizes cis male dominance and has the utmost power to control those on the margins. The UK government compromising on trans rights by excluding them from the ban of conversion practices. The UK and Indian government recognizing trans identity only if there are medical reports and a psychological diagnosis of gender dysphoria. And to add to this, on October 4th, 2023, Rishi Sunak, the UK's prime minister, made anti-trans comments at the Conservative Party's conference. He said, we shouldn't get bullied into believing that people can be any sex they want to be. They can't. A man is a man and a woman is a woman. That's just common sense. These are apt examples of the omnificent power of the patriarchy. Such comments, such anti-trans comments lead to violence and transphobic comments lead to violence, trauma, um, harm and goes beyond and against any equality and diversity values. This leads to lower funds being allocated to different systems like the education system, the medical system, basically all systems. And that leads to people not being equipped enough to work with trans men. So this visual documentation that you see on your screen right now is something I've had to create for my PhD, is where trans men sit within the margins um, of the society. 
trans men are oppressed within their own trans community and the larger patriarchal society. This leads and creates prolonged exclusion, confusion, discomfort, disconnect with the body, um, isolation, hidden, unexpressed, unresolved, unexplored identity. And to expand on this, the place of work, study, family, friends, ethnic groups, housing, um, education systems, nationality, religion may feel unsafe while they're grappling with defining their own gender identity. Research foregrounds the body by paying attention to how these social positions on the screen are constituted through multiple interrelated differences being lived in, out, and within the body. So bell hooks theory of margins to the center play a huge role in this research implies the struggles of trans men who are in the extreme margins and I as the researcher I am informed by being closer to the center and in comparison to the trans men's margins. So next slide please. Thus moving trans men in the patriarchy is a feminist practice-led interdisciplinary inquiry. It is cross-cultural and taps into the essential needs, equal human rights, mental well-being, free embodied expression, and advocacy allyship. It is informed by dance movement psychotherapy, creative arts therapy, psychology, and artistic practices. I'm expanding on my master's research that highlighted cisgendered men's emotional expression and dance movement psychotherapy. And that evidenced the invisibility of trans men, not just in research and practice, but even training. Um, so yeah, thus the, the some of the main research intentions are to curate therapeutic spaces where trans men can move from the margins to increased visibility, to equip mental health professionals to provide trans affirmative care, to raise awareness and advocate for trans men's mental health, through embodied performances or film. To add to this, I also believe that we need to add more to our training programs. There needs to be more about how we can equip ourselves better to work with the unique life stressors of people um, who belong to the LGBTQ plus communities. So just quickly, it's a feminist intersectional methodology, uh, which provides a foundation for reframing and creating new knowledge based on dissecting the center and to challenge the traditional ways of doing research, training, and practice. Um, next slide, please. So the forms of data production in this research have been interviews with psychotherapists, creative art therapists who have worked with trans men. So five interviews in India and five interviews in the UK and a six to eight week dance movement psychotherapy group um, in both the countries. My research, me as a researcher's movement journal and co-created embodied performance of film. Next slide, please. So just reflecting on the events question, how can we navigate intersections within marginalized spaces? So here, when I was reflecting on this question, two words that came up for me were improvising and adapting. And this was thoroughly experienced during my field work and clinical work in India. So I would like to just give you a brief overview of the work I did with trans men in India. So the whole idea was to have a six to eight week group and I had reached out to various organizations in India who work for trans rights and most majority of the people who belong to that organization also belong to low socioeconomic backgrounds or come from low socioeconomic backgrounds and after I went to India and I interacted with the organizations, I realized that a six to eight week group is overly ambitious. Um, and for multiple reasons, for multiple intersections, to name a few, one was that a lot of them work Monday to Saturday and Sundays was the only day that they get off. And to commit to a six week Sunday also being occupied with processing and with therapy was just too much to um, offer. At the same time, there was a lot about uh, providing the space. There was a dearth of space where they were like, we cannot promise consistent space for six weeks to go. Um, also, these organizations 
also are a form of shelter homes where people live there. So there was that boundary setting of, you know, we can't just be, we can't just let the group to be for trans men. It also has to include trans women because they all live together. So that was another thing. Um, language. There were various regional languages being spoken, uh, Bengali, Kannada, Tamil, Hindi, Malayalam, and I unfortunately was only well versed with some of the languages and I had to then get a translator and that's when actually the body, the art came into picture. That's when I worked so much with the body, with the non-verbal gesture, movement, um, artwork, especially postcards. That did wonders and that was literally the binding force of all the sessions and workshops. Um, so yes, yeah, so just coming back to that, the organizations then requested that two organizations wanted me to facilitate four hour workshops and one organization wanted me to facilitate a four week group, which was in itself great. And I took it with all like with open arms and I was like, I'm just going to go for it. Um, so the four week group was a close group of six trans men. And I just want to also mention that the way I was navigating through these intersections was that my groups were open to everyone who identified as a trans man. They didn't have to medically, physically transition to be a part of the group. They people who you know, socially transitioned, people who believed they were trans men were welcome in the groups. Um, so the four week group was a closed group. The workshops was a mixed group of trans women and trans men. And one of the workshops actually even had the partners of trans men in it because because they live in a shelter home and if they aren't together, they feel they're more receptive to violence and harm. So they try and be together. And um, through the group and through the workshop, we did try to engage them separately in smaller groups uh, so they could also find their own expression without their partners in the smaller groups. Um, and in the UK, the it has been another ball game altogether. Uh, finding therapists who have specifically not yet, sorry, finding therapists who have specifically worked with trans men was challenging. Um, Additionally, um, yeah, and I think also when I reached out to different organizations in terms of, uh, you know, the groups, I think a lot of organizations refused to support the workshop because one, uh, due to, sorry, I just lost the train, lost my train of thought, but one, because of uh, research fatigue and two, because of my positionality. So that brings me to this slide. Um, so one of this was the major theme that came up from this research. And just so everyone knows, I have just entered my third year and I'm still transcribing all the data from my research. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the most prominent theme that came up, which was my positionality and how that plays out in the therapeutic space. So just to also make my positionality very clear, I'm a cisgendered heterosexual Indian dance movement psychotherapist who was trained in the UK. I grew up in a typical Indian joint family where I saw and witnessed the patriarchy play out in various ways within the society, the culture, and my family. So moving to London, I experienced a different kind of marginalization now of being categorized as South Asian, but I'm also aware of the privilege I've had to move here in comparison to a lot of my peers. So acknowledging that we all hold privilege and marginalization in our bodies at the same time, and that those polarities can coexist. Um, and you know, to, to move with this, I'm constantly engaging, constantly interacting with people from the communities to remove any blind spots and to also understand and constantly engage with my privileges that I'm holding on to in this research. So let's talk about the two images. So the one on your left or right, I'm assuming the one which is closed, uh, but for y'all on your right is it, it's a still from a move from my research movement journal. And this was in the four, I think it was the fourth month of my research journal. And 
I remember it was just there was a lot of fear and tension that I was holding on to. And I feel at least for the for a good one and a half years of this research, I held on to that tension and fear a lot. The fear of saying something wrong, the fear of coming across as being insensitive, the fear of doing something wrong, the fear of being cancelled. And the most important, the fear of not being aware of not being educated enough. Um, but I think through constant um, research, through constant engagement, you know, going for different plays, watching different movies to understand you know, the, the unique life stressors and more about the lived experiences of trans men and the LGBTQ plus communities in general it really helped me. And uh, it also helped me engage with my assumptions, inhibitions, views, around working with them. So I found an antidote to this through movement, which I would request you to play. Sorry, can I just, yes. Um, so I found an antidote through movement and the three words that come up for me is acceptance. It doesn't have any sound, so that's fine. Uh, acceptance, curiosity and compassion. So recognizing therapy is not a politically free space. Sorry, can you just mute it? <laughs> Sorry about that. So just recognizing that therapy is not a politically free space and therapy can often be a luxury as well as a privilege, especially for those in the LGBTQ plus communities to find a therapist who is well versed or who is aware of their embodied positionality and how that plays out in the room. Um, and just given the fact when a therapist is aware, that does mean that they've done extra work and because it has been neglected in training. So I have inferred that it is imperative for a therapeutic relationship that a therapist is constantly engaging with their positionality to identify how intersectionalities live um, and sit in power, privilege and oppression. That being said, I'm gonna pause here for a second just to notice what's coming up for everyone on the screen and for everyone right here in person. I'm aware that these were too many words and there was a bit of confusion and I was rushing. So just noticing what's coming up for everyone. Just taking a moment to ground yourself in the moment. If you're comfortable, feel free to close your eyes. If not, have a soft lowered gaze. Just connecting with your breath. And while you're connecting with your breath, I would like to invite you all for an experiential where I am going to call out three questions. And I would just like to invite you to notice how your body is responding to them. Any sensations, movements, images, um, anything that comes up for you, questions. So the first question is, what are the various intersectionalities that you live with every day? I'll repeat that again. What are the various intersectionalities that you live with every day? And how are these intersectionalities placed in power and oppression? Coming back to your breath. Whenever you're ready, coming back to the space. So, for people who are online, can we spend the next one minute just reflecting on whatever came up for you um, on paper? And for people who are in the room right now, can I request you to reflect on this? So, it's almost like we're creating a virtual or creating a, a group 
postcard sort of thing. So any images, any drawings, scribbles, questions, words, anything, there's art material there as well. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> just to say you've got about 10 minutes, just under 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few more seconds. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Coming back to the space now, I see a few things in the chat box, a few words. Um, and there's a lot of flow and connection in the, the artwork here and the creation here. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I think just to conclude, yes, I see women, white, cis, parent, employed, British, divorced. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I just want to reiterate, next slide please, that this was just a sneak peek into my research uh, and there's so much more that is that goes into it. Um, but just to conclude and come back to the events questions, right? So constant engagement, constant embodied engagement to place the client's lived experiences is central to our work and that will support us in shaping our responses to the LGBTQ plus perspectives and curiously evaluating how our positionality given the power and oppression and gender and sexuality come in the forefront of our work will enable us to navigate these intersections in marginalized spaces. So that was my presentation. Thank you. And the floor is now open for some questions. Yes, we have about five minutes and then we have more time right at the end. Yeah. So um, I don't know if there's anything in the chat, Davide, or anyone in the room who wants to ask something. Nothing yet. OK, that's fine. If anyone has any questions, please let me know. Is that something in the room? Yes. Um, so you talked about the use of postcard mm -hmm. um, and also embodied engagement. Have you got any sort of snapshots of how you I actually do have the postcards in my bag okay. to show you <laughs> I guess I'm curious to yeah. hear if there were like specific moments or interventions or things that oh, yeah, definitely. were really impactful. Yeah, so one thing that I did was placing the postcards on the floor where the they were encouraged to move around and see which postcard really connects to them and resonates with them. And once they picked it up, it was a lot about how it connects to their story. So some people spoke about their past and, you know, what story their past it connects to. But some people were like, this is my dream. This is where I want to be or this is how I want to look or this is what I want to do. Um, and some people were reminded of some certain memories. Some people were reminded of their homes that they can't go to or they're not allowed to go to anymore. So the postcards basically led to their stories, their expression and exploration of their own stories. And um, yeah. I hope that answers your question. It did. Can I ask a follow up question? Course, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering like how you then got that into the body. Oh, and oh yeah. So, the body can be hard. so before they could get into the verbal sharing, I said, share with your body first. And then they would verbally share. And then I would ask them to share again with their bodies and see how 
it was either the movement was exaggerated or either the movement became smaller or the breath was held or the breath became like there was a huge sigh. So I think it was a lot about first feeling it in the body. Actually, you know what? I'm sure they obviously felt it in their body first. So first really allowing the body to express it, then add words to it and then again, let the body do it. So then it really registers in the body and it also registers verbally. Um, but again, like I said, there was a lot of language uh, differences there. So that's why there was just so much body involved. And I think constant reflecting back as well that, oh, I felt this in my body. And I wonder, you know, where that's coming from. Or even, you know, sometimes I had to sort of give them that prompt as well that I'm feeling this. Did you feel this? And they were like, yeah, exactly. This is what I felt. So, yeah. I'm curious about the response. I mean, you said that, you know, some of the organizations that you uh, got hold of were obviously interested in the work, but yeah. I'm interested also, what was the general response to a dance movement psychotherapist yeah. in India doing this work? <laughs> I think there was a lot of psychoeducation involved in the first session, or at least in the workshop, the first half an hour, it was a lot of psych psychoeducation that we're not going to be dancing dancing because they thought oh it's going to be a dance workshop and you know you're going to teach us some steps what songs are you going to play and things like that so I really had to break it down and say this is therapy and actually having a consent form was very helpful because that said everything um, so really breaking the consent form in the first session or the first half an hour really helped them understand what they were being involved in but once we really got into the work and there was more sharing and individual sharing and group sharing and pair sharing I think that's when they were like okay we now understand the work and they really got into it and they enjoyed it because they finally felt seen and heard um, in ways probably they haven't really been to yet. Does the experience and how they clients engaged and compare or relate to your master's research. Can you repeat it again so that oh yeah, say it again oh. <laughs> louder. Thank you for that. <laughs> so yeah, how does your experience and your observations of how this client group engaged in movement and expressed themselves through their yeah. bodies really. compare and relate to what you observed in your master's? Yeah. That be this. This man. This man. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because my master's was also very limited. I wasn't doing first hand work. I wasn't doing groups with cis men. It was predominantly interviewing therapists who have worked with men. Um, so the movements, of course, I think the, th the therapists I interviewed were very OK with moving. So there was a lot. The, there were bigger movements and all of that. But I think in this research, I was also working with a client group that has experienced a lot of trauma in their bodies. So the body is a way, it's it, it, it's almost like the body is a way or was something that oppressed them, but it's also something that can free them, if that's the right word I can use. So again, the polarity and um, the, the different ways in which things coexist. So I think there was a lot of resistance in, at first and then really go, go using props. Using props was something that we did using, um, what did we use? Ribbons, using mirroring and all of that really helped. So I think to answer your question, of course, I think I saw more progression this time in comparison to my masters. And my masters was cis men and here this is trans men. So I think there's a lot of um, nuances that go into it, but in my body, I felt more tension uh, and resistance in movement in this research in comparison to cis men. Um, of course, there was still a lot of tension there, but there wasn't resistance. But here there was resistance, there was tension. At the same time, like, I don't know, a feeling of curiosity and openness. But in my master's, it was more about, yeah, okay, let's get with it, you know? I don't know if it's because it was a short period of time, basically. Yeah. Is there anything online, Davide, before we thank no, Sandy? Quite a few. Is there any comments online or anything? No, it's, uh, it's can you, here before there. How did you decide to enter? Let's take one question oh. from there so, and then we'll need to stop. 
Okay. Yeah, there are a few questions here. And also, I think Eleanor had her hand up for a while. Um, I don't know if you still have a question or if it's been answered, but um, yeah. It was actually asked in the chat. So. Oh, was it? Okay, great. <laughs> okay. So, is, which question was it in the chat? Is it one that's. I was finding the discussion around language and bodies so interesting. And then Judith asked, um, have you found that the language barrier can be helpful in a sense to make us more aware of our bodies and listening to our body more? Yes, definitely. I was so I was I think as a researcher, I was very worried about the language barrier and finding a translator who was also ethically you know, aware. And it just worked well in terms of just the images, bodies. And I think, yes, I think the language barrier, the language differences was helpful in this situation because also I really want to acknowledge the fact that be, being trained in the UK, we adopt a very different kind of language. But in India, I cannot use the same language. I can't say, OK, so how, where does that feel in your body or how does that feel? Or let's take up space because <laughs> They couldn't, they were like, what space? You know, we only have this much space. So where do we go? So I think I really had to tweak my language. And that's where I was like, I think gestures and movements just helped because I was also struggling with finding the right kind of words that would fit that population as well, like the Indian population. So again, to answer the, the event question, these are the different ways in which we can navigate through the interse intersections of these spaces. But I think definitely a language barrier was helpful in terms of getting creativity and the bodies more involved. So thank you for the questions. Thank well, you. We need, to, we need to wrap it up there, but can we just thank Sanjini, please? Thank you very much. So we're just going to make a um, transition to Dr. Jessica Collier. So just take a stretch, take a breath in the spirit of dance movement psychotherapy. <laughs> and uh, we'll make a shift in a moment. To Dr. Jessica Collier, who's going to present her work and her thoughts. <laughs> uh, can everybody hear OK? Yep, OK. First of all, I want to say hi, Rose. I haven't seen you in ages and it's really nice to see you. <laughs> um, and very quickly, uh, I'm a huge fan of case studies um, and my PhD was bringing together a bunch of case studies about uh, women in prison and kind of creating knowledge through those case studies. But this is just one of those case studies. And in fact, this wasn't part of my PhD. This is something more recent. So I'm going to jump straight in. Um, so the factors that lead women to be imprisoned, they are complex and they're rooted in the collective wish to punish those who transgress their allotted position in society. And that means that the psychopathology experienced by LGBTQ women in prison is more correctly located in our intolerant and dogmatic heteronormative culture than in the female prison population. In a patriarchal society, women who are angry are vulnerable to be being labelled mad or bad. And for them, recognition of the full spectrum of human complexity does not exist. This refusal to see women as individual human beings is amplified when they further contravene expectations by identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender or queer. And this is amplified further for women of colour and other minoritised women. Audre Lorde very succinctly stated that we operate in the teeth of a system for which racism and sexism are primary, established and necessary props for profit. And most women in prison are criminalised based on their own experience of discrimination, abuse and poverty. This paper explores the origins of this pathologising of LGBT. Q plus women, I'm going backwards. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> going on here. 
it's quite interesting that I'm going backwards here because when I tried to draw on the board here during the previous session, my pen was invisible. OK, this paper explores the origins of this pathologizing of LGBTQ plus women who transgress written laws through criminal acts and unspoken cultural laws through their expression of sexuality or of gender. I'm going to reflect on a woman whose sense of self was so diminished she could neither speak nor use traditional art materials to express herself. And instead, she demonstrated her psychic pain physically through self-harm inflicting life-threatening acts of violence upon herself. I'm going to discuss how we built our relationship by making models together. This required a shared gaze and our faces and bodies to be very close together. It meant that our fingertips would frequently touch. Now, each of us is born with a unique identity imprinted onto our fingertips, formed when the fetus touches the lining of the uterus meaning we carry the imprint of our mother's womb embedded on our skin. Fingerprinting as a way of identifying offenders is racialized. It was introduced in the 19th century in India by racist colonial officials to identify local citizens. The need to identify otherness, be it race, gender or sexuality, through quasi-scientific means has a long history. Research, of course, as we've heard earlier, is shaped by prevailing cultural values. In the mid 20th century, American psychoanalyst Edmund Bergler stated that I have no bias against homosexuals. For me, they are sick people requiring medical help. Still, though I have no bias, I would say homosexuals are essentially disagreeable people. Their shell is a mixture of superciliousness fake aggression and whimpering. A century earlier, von Kraft Ebbing's influential Psychopathia Sexualis viewed unconventional sexual behaviours through evolutionary theory. Non-procreative sex was regarded as a congenital disease. He relied on gender stereotypes in classifying cases of homosexuality and treated sexual orientation and gender identity concepts as one. They're simply men in women's garb, he said, and women in men's attire. The founder of forensic psychology, Cesare Lombroso, saw homosexuality and gender nonconformity as deviance. Although he was very unusual in exploring female criminality at all, Lombroso argued that lesbians were biologically inferior to normal women, further down the evolutionary ladder than men, and that female criminals were so powerfully archaic that they embodied true monsters, reflecting the values and the rigid gender roles of the time. Lombroso stated that honest women are kept in line by factors such as maternity, piety and weakness. When a woman commits a crime despite these restraints, this is a sign that her power of evil is immense. His views on lesbianism were unambiguous. The majority of lesbians, he said, are not born lesbians, but rather occasional lesbians who borrow the virile traits of the criminal and the prostitute. Now, this historical context is important because while scholarship that categorizes LGBTQ plus individuals may seem outdated, a study as recently as 2018 claimed that digital software could distinguish between gay and straight people because the researchers claimed gay men have narrow jaws and long noses and lesbians have large jaws. <laughs> so today, while views on homosexuality in some Western countries are more liberal, the gender binary still dominates. To maintain it, most cultures insist that everyone be assigned either male or female at birth and conform to this category ever after. In prisons in the UK, this debate is intense. While the mainstream media publish scaremongering stories about trans women assaulting female prisoners, statistics suggest you are far more likely to be sexually assaulted as a trans prisoner than by a trans prisoner. 
Prisoners who identify as transgender must not be confused with individuals who use the concept of gender diversity as a means of committing offences. Uh, in the words of Britain's longest serving trans prisoner, Sarah Jane Baker, if some pervert should wear a frock to invade a women's space to commit an offence, that doesn't make them transgender, it makes them a pervert. It's also important to remember that cis women have not been historically oppressed by trans women, but by cis males, manifesting in catastrophic global rates of gender violence and femicide. Writer Rebecca Solnit emphasizes that the danger comes from straight men and patriarchy, where the lion's share of violence against women comes from is rape and domestic violence and harassment and murder. This is important in the context of the female prisoner state where many men work, including officers with keys to the women's cells. The evidence of one trans prisoner suggested that she had been subject to sexual assaults Harassment, sorry, this is a very, very sensitive computer. Intimidation and bullying from male prison staff. It should not be assumed that just because prisoners do not report abuse by prison staff, abuse is not happening. Nevertheless, trans people are scapegoats taking the position freed up by more tolerant attitudes to gay men and lesbians who were previously considered a threat to heteronormative ideology. And while trans women seem particularly provocative to many people, trans men seem to attract less abhorrence until they arrive in court. There have been a number of long convictions of lesbians and trans men following prosecutions for what Professor Alex Sharp labels gender identity fraud whereby cis and heterosexual narratives are privileged. Thus, a biased attitude to homosexuality and gender nonconformity is embedded in the criminal justice system. It's difficult to imagine a more concrete symbol of a structural and symbolic violence than a women's prison, a punitive container in which intersections of gender identity, sexuality, race, poverty and deprivation constitute the incarcerated population. This is amplified by one of the biggest symbols of an us and them culture, the lack of diversity among those making important decisions from prison officers to, to the judiciary. I'm gonna talk about Sam, who was a cisgendered white woman who identified as lesbian. She was serving an imprisonment for public protection sentence for robbery. IPPs were created by the Criminal Justice Act to protect the public from serious offenders whose crimes did not merit a life sentence. They left offenders and victims uncertain about when an offender would be released and were abolished in 2012, but there are still over a thousand prisoners with IEP sentences. This uncertainty about ever being released was taking its toll on Sam who at the time we met had been in prison on a two year tariff for 12 years. Sam had a violent family history and described how her four brothers were given privileges and permission to go into the world while Sam, the only girl, was made to stay at home and do housework. This inequity left her feeling worthless and engendered a deep feeling of resentment, which could not be articulated verbally, but manifested in bad behavior and criminal activity, stealing cars, dealing drugs and transgressing the gender role she had been assigned. Over time, Sam found acceptance from a group of older criminal men who made use of her willingness to use violence. Sam explained that she felt scared of her emotions and that harming herself was the only way she could hold on to what she called her true self. This reminded me of Winnicott's concept of the false self as an adaption to a difficult early environment. Sam may have unconsciously immersed herself in an environment where front was all consuming by coming to prison. I've just got to let Paolo in. <laughs> Forensic psychotherapy emphasizes the importance of understanding violence as a response to external society concerns as well as internal conflicts. Humiliation, shame, and feeling disrespected have to be considered. 
We are aware that poverty, inequality and discrimination cause violence, yet there's no wish to transform the status quo. Structural violence depends on the upholding of the patriarchy and can only be challenged by modifying what we mean by masculinity and femininity. The poor and members of minority racial and ethnic groups are regularly subjected to maximal degrees of shame, humiliation, and feelings of inferiority. Nothing stimulates crime and violence more than the division of males and females. Nothing stimulates violence more powerfully and effectively than homophobia. I'll say that twice. <laughs> For Sam, the lifelong feelings of inferiority inherent in not only being a woman, but a woman who did not match the heteronormative ideal, appeared to play an important part in her self-perception and her violence. Sam described feelings of shame, but could only express these by continuing to self-harm, which she did by making deep cuts into her abdomen, which she would reopen time and again. This occasioned enormous loss of blood and risk of death. Now, it often happens in art psychotherapy in prison that the negative perception that art is for kids proves too substantial an obstacle for individuals who've been denied an opportunity to play in childhood. In our session, Sam would mostly decline the offer of art materials. She was unable to speak and was often in physical pain from her repeated self-harm. I found myself consumed with anxiety that if my curiosity felt too intrusive, Sam would leave the session and cut herself again. On one occasion, she self-harmed just prior to our session, and I found her collapsed in her cell in a pool of blood. Seeing Sam like this was distressing. And in the countertransference, this made me feel it was me who was harming her, my questions penetrating her in a way that was intolerable. Subsequently, I tried to speak with Sam about the struggle she might have been having in thinking I could recognize her emotional pain without her having to show me physically. Sam couldn't bear to talk about this and would lose her voice and stammer. The terror on both our parts, the fear of reopening old wounds, kept us stuck and unable to find a way of being together that we could both endure. In an attempt to make the sessions more tolerable for, our, for us both, I reflected on a story Sam had told me about fixing motorbikes with her brother. Winnicott wrote that psychotherapy has to do with two people playing together. Playing implies trust. I suggested to Sam that we could make a model together, perhaps a motorbike. In the weeks while we waited for the model to be approved by security, Sam spoke about her children and her role as a mother, her feelings about her body, her identity and her relationships. Sam disclosed the complex persona she had developed outside adopting a stereotypically masculine, aggressive criminal identity in her offending, but simultaneously bearing children for her female partner who was unable to give birth. Though she loved her kids, adults now, Sam had felt disgusted by her body during pregnancy. She felt it was not hers and said the children had been conceived through rape. I tentatively linked this experience to the way she self-harmed the deep cuts to her abdomen in the region of her womb. But this interpretation was way too soon, and my, it was my own compulsion to make meaning of Sam's dilemma that was overwhelming. Winnicott noted that psychotherapy is not making clever and apt interpretations, but it is the long-term giving the patient back what the patient brings. Queer artists have long used their bodies to explore multiple layers of identity and oppression. Catherine Opie's classic series of self-portraits highlight the idea that domesticity is seen as an exclusively heterosexual normative experience. Cutting conveys a child's drawing with subject and background symbolic of fertility and abundance. The two women scratched into the artist's skin represent a family. Similarly, her self-portraits pervert and nursing directly address identity politics, sexuality and heteronormative expectations of normality. What is normality anyway, Opie asks. 
The binary of normality and abnormality, it's a psychological assignment on our bodies in relationship to how we live our lives. And that is a problem. Zanelli Muholi's photographs reference the intolerance and violence faced by the black LGBTQ plus community in South Africa. Aftermath shows a person covering themselves, assuming from the title of the work after they have been assaulted. Clear evidence of an earlier trauma on the person's body demonstrates the relentlessness of violence against LGBTQ plus people. Muholi remarked, I've seen people speaking and capturing images of lesbians on our behalf as if we are incapable and mute. I refuse to become subject matter for others and to be silenced. Clearly, Siam's identity was a primary source of complexity and discomfort for her. But what Sam was inflicting upon herself had a less conscious motivation than the visual polemic of queer art. Anna Mox suggests that a woman may attack her own body in order, in order to test its strength. She hurts her own body because she sees it as bad or alien part of herself. It is unwanted and must be cut out or punished. Lesbian bodies, especially old lesbian bodies, and the prison service officially considers prisoners to be old when they are 50, have almost no cultural worth. But how to take this idea forward with Sam when thinking was so intolerable and emotions so dangerously somatized and violently acted out? Then our Suzuki GT 3T <laughs> ATB arrived and we set to work. The unbearable silence and attempts at connection morphed quickly into a collaboration in which metaphorical discussions could be had. We spoke about picking up pieces, putting things together, exercising patience, tenacity, working and looking together. We discussed attention to detail, following directions, sustaining concentration, and the importance of trust. Just gotta let JD in. Oh, you're that included. The motorbike was far more difficult to make than either of us had anticipated, and we had to work through not understanding the instructions. This was frustrating, and initially Sam could not tolerate the anxiety. She would walk out, slam the door, afraid of her anger, afraid that she'd damaged the Suzuki, much like she feared damaging others and herself. But slowly, Sam learned to tolerate our getting it wrong together, laughing at my mistakes, and taking care not to spoil the delicate model. Playing is essentially satisfying, wrote Winnicott. This is true even when it lead, leads to a high degree of anxiety. During the work, our hands and fingers would frequently touch. Initially, I felt concerned by this. We are taught that one of the key aspects of psychotherapy is the avoidance of physical contact, not least it is as it may be meeting the unconscious needs of the therapist. Hannah Segal stated that uh, the appropriate expression of love by the analyst is understanding. While Brett Carr says that the, the physical interaction between two people can so easily be triggering unconscious memories of earlier physical interactions especially those of a provocative or abusive nature. Touch is crucially and culturally sensitive. It can only really be understood within the context of the relationship and the setting. Now, while I never discussed my own sexuality with Sam, it may have been apparent to her that we were roughly the same age and that I am a lesbian. She may have known that I could understand the cultural taboo of being a lesbian especially becoming an adult in the 1980s, when section 28 of the Local Government Act forbade teaching the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. Labeling same-sex relationships as pretend legitimized the regular abuse and violence lesbians received and continued to endure. The abuse of LGBTQ plus people continues to this day and is responsible for the shocking rates of suicide and depression, hate crime, bullying, 
and discrimination in healthcare experienced by the LGBT plus community. In addition, touch is the only one of our senses that is reciprocal. We cannot touch without being touched ourselves. And frankly, when my fingers touched Sam's fingers during the making of the motorbike, I felt emotionally touched. Something in this physical connection and perhaps our unspoken shared experience of having been othered mattered. Sam began linking her emotions and her identity and spoke thoughtfully about how her anger might be influenced by feeling that from a young age she had been overlooked, insignificant and treated worse than her brothers. She hated her body and said she had always felt wrong, always felt that she had done something wrong, even when she hadn't. Committing crime may have afforded Sam a justification to feel bad about something tangible. She acknowledged feeling more welcomed and valued within the criminal family hierarchy than her own. And this sense of belonging, where she was considered one of the boys, was replicated in prison, where as a bank robber, she was at the top of the prison hierarchy. Furthermore, far higher, higher numbers of women self-declare as lesbians in prison than in the community, suggesting more acceptance still. It seemed plausible then that perhaps Sam had been in prison most of her adult life because this was literally where she felt she belonged, not only through a punitive process of internal shame, but also through systemic homophobia and heteronormativity, which left no place in society for an angry, masculine identified lesbian mother than in prison. I'm aware there's a question there which I will look at shortly. Sam felt that if she were younger, she would identify as male. But she thought that this was not something an old grandmother could do. At the same time, while building the Suzuki, our discussions became more open. Whilst when something went wrong, we might disagree, even argue, but these conflicts would be resolved. And perhaps for the first time, Sam seemed to think about herself in connection to another person rather than in opposition to them. We discussed the link between mind and body, the self-injury she had been sustaining, and the physical problems she thought might be related to the aging process, including difficult feelings of loss and grief. Sam would tell me I was making her think, but her anger returned when she was not back for parole due to a wrongly prescribed medication and increased further when her next scheduled hearing was repeatedly postponed. Do you mind if I close your computer? I'm not sure it's coming from that one, but please do, yeah. <laughs> one of the difficulties of working in prison is that feelings of injustice and persecution are real life systemic inequalities. Maintaining a therapeutic stance that avoids colluding with damaging personality traits is complex when there is explicit neglect or incompetence from the prison. This not only reenacts early attachment traumas from the prisoner's past, but creates a split that is difficult to negotiate. Sam's anger at the parole board and feelings of contempt for the service seemed entirely reasonable. She would spend weeks refusing to work on the Suzuki fearing her angry feelings would spoil it. When Sam was finally given a new parole date, we finished the motorbike and our sessions came to an end. The completed model was surprisingly delicate, the artwork perhaps mirroring Sam's own fragility. But then the first pandemic lockdown happened and Sam was put back in closed conditions. Worse, her parole hearing date was pushed back and Sam made a suicide attempt, once again making a deep cut in the same place, the injury so serious that it was touch and go whether Sam would survive. When I saw her again, she did not believe her parole would ever take place and her life had become meaningless. We agreed to meet, but Sam could only speak about her physical pain. In our earliest sessions, Sam had painted a mannequin blue she had not enjoyed this symbolic process of transformation 
feeling it was messy and we put the model safely back in the closet. Much later, I found that a colleague had mistakenly allowed another prisoner to paint over it. They had painted its head orange and stuck dainty little flowers to its base as if unconsciously modifying Sam's model into a more acceptable feminine coded version. As Sam talked about the pain she felt in her body, I thought about this little blue figure, locked away. Writer Maggie Nelson wrote about physical pain in her book of prose and poetry, Bluettes. It often happens that we treat pain as if it were the only real thing, or at least the most real thing. When it comes around, Everything before it, around it, and perhaps in front of it, tends to seem fleeting, delusional. Eventually, Sam was offered another parole date. By this time, she'd served 14 years in prison on a two-year tariff. Whether she would be granted release was touch and go. And when she was finally released, she left very suddenly. Women in prison are forced to fabricate a new identity. For Sam and other LGBTQ plus women, people of colour and other minoritised individuals who are starkly overrepresented in prison, their identity has already been condemned for transgressing oppressive cultural regulations. A narrative I hear habitually from women is that prison is the safest place they have ever been. What kind of society do we live in that some people are forced albeit unconsciously, to go to prison to feel safe. Audre Lord said, those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. The overrepresentation of minoritized groups in prison, including lesbians, suggests that for many people who transgress their allotted roles, survival may require entering the criminal justice system. Art psychotherapists must acknowledge the path pathologizing of difference and recognize how our political and social apathy permeates every aspect of our work. I hope I haven't wrong. No, you're perfectly on time. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. There is a, I think, let's just hold the, you know. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to address the question there. Uh, I was trying to look at it. As take, I a few, you, but I take a few minutes so. just to absorb. <laughs> I think we'll have some time at the end as well for questions. So if, if people do have questions that have been answered um, yeah. after the last presentation, we can come back to some of those things. Because I think there's some very powerful themes um, in both Jessica's um, um, uh, presentation and, and one before. So, um, but yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I don't want to um, take up too much time. Transgender females being refused access into female prisons. That's not the case. Generally, <laughs> it can be. I think it is the case. Um, with some, not with others, it's an extremely complex subject, and I'd be happy to talk to you, Jody, about it further because it's very, very complicated. But thank you very much for the, for the question. I agree it is another example of othering females. Does anyone in the room have a, a question before we take a break? I'm, I'm super interested uh, in the use of Winnicott's play and particularly the Bertin from um, plastic arts, so such as like painting or, or just sculpting to modeling and what shift in play that creates, right? It's like because it's moving from utter creativity to reassemblage of different components uh, and uh, I don't know if, if you thought ab about this change and how meaningful it is uh, in relation to this case uh, and uh, uh, yeah for me I, I, I'm more of a play theorist so like yeah, it's yeah. interesting to think of how different kinds of play mobilize different 
pleasures uh, or vulnerabilities. Absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, leaning into being guided by the object, the resemblance. So anyway, that that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. It's very transformative. And I'm thinking always about the transitional space as well between between the person and the object. What's going on in that liminal space between where the transformation is not happening <laughs> for it to then happen. So yeah, I think all of those spaces are very interesting. Yeah, I, I don't want to sack. It's just like almost the need to bring pieces together. Mm. It's almost sim. No, I don't want to use symbolic. About it is symbolic. Go on, yeah. <laughs> to psychoanalyze, but, but like yeah, yeah, the symbolic of the subject from fragmentation. Uh, yeah, yeah, way, and. Very much. I think a lot of therapists, or certainly I'll just speak for myself, but I'm definitely thinking of it symbolically mm. as uh, kind of pulling a fragmented sort mm. of psyche or soul or experience back, back together. Yeah, rebuilding something. Definitely. Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what you say about it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Um, you showed the model where she had made and it was painted over by somebody else. I was wonder what happened in that session with, with you and her and how did she take it and what, what worked? Uh, it's a good question. She, Can you just repeat? I'm not yeah, sure. so um, Guy Three's is just asking um, what happens about the model being repainted. And Guy Three is specifically asking what happened in the session that my patient saw that it had been repainted. And um, So Sam, Sam had Sam. Sam couldn't show like any sort of conscious vulnerability. She showed her vulnerability all through her self harming. So she just said, "Doesn't matter." Was it matter? There was no kind of sense that she had been in something symbolically had been done to her. Perhaps more used to that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Over the years, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So we have um, a few more, yes. but we also need to be mindful of the time. Do you want to take one more? Yeah, Emily. Thank you. I'm art therapist. I am in France, and I I felt very uh, I felt a lot of insecurity while you were talking uh, in your presentation, and I was I was. Uh, I, I'm about to work in jail with men, and uh, I'm questioning your how you talk about feeling secure in jail and as as your choice to work there, and also about uh, this language that you use uh, because LGBTQ. I don't I don't I don't use this this. Uh, many i'm not used to this uh, language but the language that you you use will bring uh will will bring a space for people to meet you so of course i i i think that um i feel that uh um it's it's just it's i don't know how to say um i feel that uh, the body uh, suffering body is um is more uh, is more important than than the, meeting the suffering body is more important than than the how you uh, choose your uh, to live your sexuality i don't know how to explain this and you you choose this okay and and I I know this um, this uh, um, uh, article in um, uh, that I read and I use it in a research and uh, I would like to share um, its um, article from Tara Alex Lachine and Mamta Banu Dadlani and they uh, title the article Troubling Unhappiness and Hun happiness and happiness, finding pathways toward liberatory embodiment. And uh, I wanted to uh, share you this uh, excellent article that talks about um, 
more of the question of meeting the, the suffering body. There is a body happy and the body unhappy. And this body unhappy that we want to meet in a therapy, I think, mm -hmm. uh, even though, uh, but it's beyond uh, sexuality choices. And and then you, you, but in your language, you are at ease with this and you're okay. And this security that you find, I would like to know more about when you work in jail. I don't know how, if you understand my question. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll thank Thank, thanks, Emily. That's a that's that's a lot. Thank you for joining us mm. from France, and thank you for your thoughts. It'd be amazing if you can share the paper in the chat, maybe. Yeah. But just very briefly, I, I think I find personally, I find being in prison is secure for me as well. It gives me a sense of security. I don't know what I've done in my previous life. <laughs> um, and the language, I think, the language around all of this is very. Um, it's very, it's very difficult to get right. I think it, um, there's always a sort of sense of of not feeling that the language is the right language, but you know, try to use the language that I can as best I can. Uh, I'm very happy to be corrected. Um, I, do, I don't think that's what you're saying, but it does also make me think of a, a criminological. Um, idea about the pains of prison and for women the pains of prison are particularly appalling because of the traumas they've experienced before they get into prison which are generally far worse than the traumas men experience before they get into prison so there's a lot about the sort of spoiled identity and the spoiled body in criminology mm. um but i'll leave it there because i'm i'm very wary of stepping into uh xander and Ivan's time. <laughs> so can thank we you. thank Jessica one more time? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So we're just going to take a short break uh, while we make a transition. Um, stretch, breathe, drink some water, move around. Um, is Ivan, Zander, do you have thoughts about where you want us to sit? Do you want us to sit as we are now, or do you want us to go back and just? Yeah. No, I was asking how they want yeah. to do this. That was the biggest one. I sent one for Zander, and that. I got my thought. Big question there. It was like something really interesting. Maybe we need to kind of not. No, no, I think I I I mean, so definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys see? Yeah, we can see fine. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see it perfectly well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to make a start. Everybody online, welcome back. They're frozen. Are they not frozen though? <laughs> no, we're not, we're not frozen. Really frozen. Can, yeah. yeah, we can okay. see each other and we can so see, we can gonna, see you. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're going to hand over. Thank you. So yeah. Do you want some water, Zander? You got? Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ivan. Say again, Girini. Girina. Girini. Girini. Yeah, and Xander from us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is going to be a slightly different talk. Uh, a disclaimer, I'm not an arts therapist and not someone specialized uh, in well-being. Uh, I'm a media theorist uh, and uh, 
um, games, game, game study scholar, so my expertise lies in digital games. I'm going to talk about uh, digital queer subjectivities in relation to video games, and then uh, Zander, I'm going to hand over to Zander, who is uh, an emerging game designer, alumna at Brunel, who did a very interesting project about autobiography queer games, uh, and Zander will say more about that. But first, a little bit about queerness. Yeah, but... I'm not sure they can see you. Can you see Ivan? I think I mean, he's just outside the screen. If you move back yeah, a bit. Yeah, you're just outside. Even. Can you come you this just way move a back bit? A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Wait, there is, there is pretty wire, good. Wire. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe a little bit more. Oh. Is it that way? A bit more back. Back? I'm uh, not sure we can go much further back because okay, of the cord. Fine. That's good then. That's good. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's, is it's that okay? Because, it's because you're so tall, Ivan. You need to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's better. That okay? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. I'm not that interesting anyway. No, I'm no, sure they want to see you for sure. Um, so the topic, the topic of my talk today is the relationship between queer subjectivities uh, and gaming, particularly looking at how video games have incorporated queerness not only through gaming practices uh, and the communities of gamers, uh, uh, the representation of queer characters, but more importantly, in the fostering of hybrid identities, what I call the player cyborg, or other authors that play, call the player cyborg, the shape the players, uh, the players as a posthuman cyborg, which I will come to argue are in an iran and inherently queer. Uh, while I will touch upon uh, the use of video games in therapeutic context, the goal of this talk is not that to provide an exhaustive literature or understanding uh, of video games uh, in therapy. Uh, but rather to understand the relationship between games, particularly digital games, and the queer subject. Um, I will uh, talk a little bit about the video game industry and queerness uh, in gaming culture, then I will move to video game representation uh, of queerness uh, and processes of identification, moving on to queer aesthetics of games and queer, uh, sorry, digital games, queer aesthetics. Uh, and finally, closing uh, on uh, some thoughts on the queer game avant-garde and designing queer games, uh, which we'll introduce under. Um, I will touch upon uh, three main uh, aspects, uh, iconography and tropes, uh, meaning queer characters and symbols and imagery represented in video games, uh, narrative themes, storylines that have to do with queerness in games, uh, and queer design, uh, the aesthetic uh, sensorial aesthetic sensorial experience of video game aesthetics that can be queered against genre formation and normative gameplay. So without further ado, um, uh, according to a recent uh, uh, survey and uh, uh, research by the group uh, GLAD, uh, LGBTQI plus media advocacy, um, uh, group, one in five gamers identify al as LGBTQI+, while less than 2% of gaming content represent uh, such characteristics uh, through storylines or character. Regardless of the accuracy of uh, uh, such exercise in identity accountancy, I, I like to call identity accountancy, through the quantification of media content, uh, which often is based on Western century parameters of what qualifies as queer, what doesn't, and uh, disregarding other forms and sensitivity of queerness that might not be accounted as, you know, oh, there's not a rainbow sticker in the game, so it's not queer. So uh, disregarding that, what interests me really is the, the, the obsession, not the obsession, that focus on media representation and the quantification of media representation. Uh, this but one many example of the logic of queer representation, meaning the proliferation of fictional games characters that are outed by uh, the game developers, uh, either in games or in corollary media. An example of this is uh, Lena Oxton, which is one of the protagonists of Blizzard, the famous uh, uh, hero shooter Overwatch, uh, which was revealed to be homosexual in one of the comic books associated with the, with the, with the games. Importantly, none of the identifiers or characteristics of, of this character play any importance in the gameplay. The, gameplay is, uh, the game is a, a shooter game in which each player or each character has some characteristics such as healing, jumping, uh, um, shooting more like <laughs> stronger bullets, something like that. And so there is uh, a sort of like amendment uh, or, or uh, a correction of narratives around the game rather than really change within the game. 
Um, uh, Overwatch also for me works as a proxy to understand the complex uh, entanglement of creativity and entities and commodity production that ties queerness and gaming. And why do I say that? Indeed, the Blizzard Entertainment, the developers of Overwatch, uh, um, was sued by the state of California in 2021, 2021 for alleged violations of equal, equal pay right and fair employment and housing act, particularly pointing at the toxic mascul masculinist working environment, uh, which uh, reports uh, with reports of sub substance abuse and sexual harassment in the workplace uh, being very common, as well as the exploitative labor conditions uh, often associated with crunch culture in video game industry, meaning like when deadline is closed, uh, it doesn't matter the working time, people must work uh, on off the clock, uh, 14 hours a day, and uh, there is no labor rights. Um, according, uh, moreover, according to a 2021 census by UK, the trade body for the game industry in the UK, up to 20 one percent of the industry workforce identifies as LGBTQI+. Once again, highlighting a tension with the masculinist culture per pervasive within gaming and the game industry. These two examples bring to the forefront the tension traversing queer culture in gaming, meaning the relationship between players, queer identities, and video games as cultural artifacts and industrial commodities. Oh. Something popped up here. Uh, maybe it's fine. Uh, the example of Overwatch and the problematic working culture with Blizzard brings to the surface what game scholar Adrian Shaw defines a problem of visibility, quote unquote, within games and gaming industry that reduces the circulation of queer identities to an issue of representation by numbers, meaning the assumption that more characters, more storylines equal better identification and possibly a certain kind of just, um, social justice for queer, for queer folks in the industry. Um, the logic of identity as representation is not only incidental to gaming culture, but rather deeply embedded in its production processes based on the monetization of content and assets such as characters, models, weapons, and objects that can be quickly reskinned digitally uh, with the, the right identi identity markers uh, fitting a specific target audience aka or for example uh, queer folks in the sense the logic of representation has brought uh, to the proliferation of uh, quote unquote rainbow uh, patterns uh, in games such as third person shooters fortnite uh, you can see uh oh you you folks we, didn't... They, uh, we can't see it uh <laughs> What? what? They can see it though. They they can... Oh my god Mine can see it but we can't see Why it didn't you just know? in the room the yeah uh yeah. Do what they did when you post. Why? It's, 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 it's not. It's not on. Yeah, it's not on. Yeah. Oh my God. I like the IT crowd would love that. There was a show. They just turn it off. Yeah, yeah. I'm just. Sorry for the people that are looking at it or not. I tried to join the video. It's, it's, not like, it's not just my boring speech. No, <laughs> Ivan is sharing. Uh, He's come in as a yeah. guest. Hey, yeah. okay. Can you people at home still see? We, didn't we need, I don't, ah yeah, now we, can we put it full, also I don't know how to change. So, uh, yeah, yeah, wait. Um, I think it should be fine if the Teams is in the background. This is shared because of the red screen. screen. Yeah. So which which screen would it be? Yeah, yeah. Um, which screen should be sharing? Do you think probably? Oh, so we know before we move, right? And it's automatically. Uh, we click there. I was thinking that, but and then uh, and then it's all perhaps. Can you still hear us? Can anyone say something? Uh, here. Yeah, Hello. Uh, no, no. Can yeah, we can, we, can, we can still hear you and okay. just about see it's you. It's fine from the end, it's completely fine. And can they it's see the presentation? Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, they can. I think they if can. you have a presenter mode, it should... Uh, can you still see the presentation? Yeah, we can still now see the presentation. Now everyone can see it. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. So, 
going back to the logic of identity as representation is not only incidental to gaming culture, but rather deeply embedded in the production processes based on the monetization of content and assets such as character models, weapons, and objects that can be quickly reskinned with the right identify, identity markers uh, fitting a specific tar target audience. Uh, in the sense, the logic of representation has brought to the proliferation of rainbow object patterns in games, such as um, uh, Fortnite that you see here in the slide, uh, with the increase uh, in revenues uh, uh, and in the consumption of digital in-game content, uh, such as expansion, DLC, loot boxes, which are these funny little chests where it's basically a slot machine where people, folks, gamers can find a new weapon or something prompted by the idea of new markers that can be acquired to customize the digital character. Um, for show, such issue comes from the confusion between media representation and social identities that fundamentally misreads the process of identification taking place between the two. Uh, through a qualitative ethnographic research, show finds a mismatch between uh, social identity, uh, the social identity of the players, uh, and the representation they seek in media such as video games. Uh, building on queer theorist Jose Esteban Munoz, uh, and on his concept of disidentification, which articulates uh, the negotiation of uh, minoritarian groups uh, with uh, hegemonic identities outside uh, of logic of either assimilation or rejection, but rather in a tension or in a disidentification. Uh, so building on Munoz, uh, uh, Shaw basically proposes a model of identification that works across two axes, identifying us, forget that the big, yeah, quote, identifying us, meaning identifying with characters through identity marker. I identify as Italian, gay, queer, Sardinian, uh, atheist, etc. And identifying with, which means identify across the axis of empathy and sympathy with situation and events rather than uh, with markers. So through this survey, what Shaw finds out is that, that actually players really like to identify with characters that has nothing to do with them, indeed seek this identification, rather the conformity and identity markers, or at least that the both things can be held at the same time within the virtual space, occasionally leaning towards similarities and difference in a sort of dance that is probably very familiar to any Lacanian here, um, uh, and particularly through ideas of mirror stage applied to media and a constant uh, identification and disidentification with the body of the other. Um, sorry, that was a very... So... Um, so this, this identification is predicated on the understanding of experience rather than sharing uh, of common social cultural markers, such as the loss uh, uh, of uh, a character or a familiar uh, parasocial uh, um, uh, uh, relationship, uh, the sense of overcoming difficulties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If, as argued by media theorist Alexander Galloway, though video games are mainly actions, uh, their aesthetic cannot be reduced uh, or solely understood uh, on the circulation of images and storylines, uh, but rather needs to be acknowledged as, uh, as a, on, on a systemic level through the rules and mechanics that shape the action taken by the player and consequently through the bodily response of those actions that manifest uh, into the affect of gaming. Uh, when we think about video game aesthetics, it's very very easy to reduce it to graphics, characters, et cetera, et cetera. But really what media theorist Alexander Galloway point, among other game scholar, is that video game aesthetic passes through the body for before the eyes. It's the stress, is the angst, is the exhilaration, is the weeping, is the is the laughter that comes through player if you ever watched a competitive gamer playing, you probably know those moments of tension, or if you have a teenager at home, it's probably <laughs> that, that the sense of that affectivity, that tense affectivity, that transfer oftentimes from the gameplay session to the interaction with the player uh, in that in that moment of indecisiveness, right? Being in between the gameplay and and so it is an attention to the body that really interests me here in relation to queer aesthetics rather than queer representation and to the mechanics of the games and how these games work. Uh, during the past 
last 20 years, the research has proliferated uh, on the dangerous nature of gaming as a structure of aggression, exemplifying the video game violence debate. Are we all going to become you know, mass shooters because of video games? Or their salvific power to improve or even recover declining cognitive skills. Everyone should tr try Tetris because uh, our brain uh, is going to benefit. Despite, despite the seemingly lack of agreement on the media effects debate, what is interesting here is uh, the imbrication of the player subject with technology that, for example, improves either its peripheral vision or is connected to diseases such as carpal tunnel syndrome, obesity, and enables the experimentation with virtual persona that inform our identities. I will go on. So I'm transitioning from seeing identities as artifacts such as images to the relationship of the player with the, uh, the player body with the, with the gaming technology. The question of representation and interaction is also central to contemporary approaches in psychotherapy and well-being applied to gaming, which either condemn gaming as uh, causes of alienation and even antisocial behavior in youth or celebrate their ability to foster cognitive development and even emotional, uh, emotional awareness. As noticed by many game scholars, uh, incidentally, in the field of, of cognitive psychology, video games uh, affect, affect players' identity not only on an emotional level, but also on a cognitive and physiological level. Volumes such as the ones that you see on screens, Rachel Coward's Video Games and Wellbeing, and Anthony Bean's Working in Video Games uh, 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 with Video Gamers and Games uh, in Therapy, emphasize the possibility of using video games as tools in therapeutic context, either through the mechanic ability to motivate the player to overcome obstacle, channeling the famous flow effect, uh, that boundary between boredom and frustration that should give, according to Csikszentmihalyi, the optimal experience. Um, and what I contest here is oftentimes still in, translated in this therapeutic context, this per using te technological tools, particularly video games, for the perfecting of the human, either through the mind, cognitive abilities, or the body. An example is offered by uh, Aldirian therapist Francesco Bocci, who proposes video game therapy as a method that employs digital games as tool for uh, quote-unquote emotional regulation and quote-unquote emotional exploration, end quote. Um, of the subject uh, using four stages. Uh, I'm not an expert in Aldirian psychology, but it's engagement, uh, assessment, insight, and reorientation, where basically the role of the therapist is that of accompanying uh, uh, the player through their narrative and emotional journey, exploring themes found in the game that supposedly are more impactful because of the interaction, the choices, the agency of the player. You are, you know, the world is your oyster. You take uh, action and choices in the digital world and and the associated sense uh, or um, of uh, self-efficacy, what in video game uh, aesthetic theory is called agency, that comes from these artifacts. Um, according to um, Bocci, uh, this is fostered by, of course, the promise of total immersion and continuous feedback uh, uh, that it's also embodied in uh, Chips and Mihaly uh, flow, uh, perfectly automatized by the game that is capable of, at any time, provide positive or negative reinforcement depending on the uh, performance uh, of the player. Um, I think such ideas and experimentation with digital games in relation to therapeutic settings are welcome and interesting, at least to me, uh, as argued by B, but as argued by being, they don't always allow to, quote, see through uh, the behavioral action psychology. Sometimes uh, they get caught up with, really, in relationship uh, to, to the gaming performance. Uh, as argued by Brendan Keogh in his book, Play Your Bodies, the player relationship with gaming emerges uh, as uh, what we can call a techno-body assemblage of organic and inorganic matter, our body and these plastic uh, uh, metallic objects. Um, so organic and inorganic matter, material and abstract forms, which inform uh, our identity as techno-humans. Uh, particularly, Keogh highlights two cultural tendencies in reading these 
assemblage of technologies embody. That of the gamer as hacker, which identifies games as gamers as masters of technology, through which uh, it can, uh, the gamer can assert its masculinist uh, power and uh, create a tale of progression, versus the gamer as a player cyborg, uh, which instead uh, celebrates uh, uh, the impure and the hybridity with the machine is, is more focused in the continuum between human and non-human uh, rather than in the assertion of masculinist power. Indeed, uh, cycling back uh, to the uh, central topic on queerness, a quick search between these two volumes interestingly reveals uh, the absence of uh, the word queerness or gay, uh, and these are big volumes, uh, 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 at any point. Which leads me to think how certain therapeutic contexts adopting game sort of replicate uh, a digital uh, gaming culture that associate gaming with perfecting, with progress, with the logical progression, rather than with these hybridities. So going close to close to pass to Zander, um, uh, uh, I want to turn to Aubrey Annabelle's uh, uh, work, who, building on the work of cultural theorist Raymond Williams, uh, look at digital games as structures. Well, it's, uh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> it's more important. Uh, as, uh, as, um, so turning to uh, Aubrey Annabelle, who works uh, on Raymond uh, uh, Williams' idea of uh, uh, structural feelings, Aubrey Annabelle theorizes video games again as a structure, um, uh, as structures of feelings to explore the affect and affective responses that circulate between the body of the players and that of the game apparatus, between the cultural identities and the aesthetic of the game system that shape the subject formation beyond paradigm of representation or narrative empathy passing instead to the action of the games that take in the quotidian context of the player. What I basically mean here is just that in, as in the slide, that um, the affect of game is not charged in the representational characters or in the storyline, but in the actions of the player and how they shape our movement uh, through infinite loop or repetitions uh, and establish a very material relationship with our body. In turn, uh, contemporary queer theory um, the turn of contemporary queer theory to embodied and affective experiences has led game scholars such as Bo Ruber to theorize the rise of queer games avant-garde, meaning the development of games that embrace queerness not on a representation level or on a narrative level, but by short-circuiting established uh, game mechanics, genre, what is the norm, what is supposed to happen in a game, achievement, progress, uh, all these logics that are embedded in the algorithmic uh, log, uh, uh, object artifact through the rules. And uh, I'm going to pass here to Zander because uh, Zander's uh, presentation uh, is actually tied to a project that attempts to do this querying to an auto autobiographical queer model. Hopefully, this is going to be <laughs> seamless. Right? I didn't take too much time. No, all good. Fine. Is this the one? Yes. Yeah, it's missing the images. It's fine. That's. I mean, it's just, it's just for the exercise that the. It's fine. Let's see if we can get. Mm -hmm. think about <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about the um, nation project that I did together with Yvonne on my master's degree about two years ago now. So um, to explain like what this project actually is, is that we were tasked with picking research topic, a thesis, all pretty standard. But we also had to create a, a prototype for a digital video game that was going to be informed by the body of research that we put together. And uh, for my uh, project, I ended up with three different chapters. In the first one, I discussed the current labor circumstances and developments in the games industry before talking about how that specifically affected marginalized creators and their work. 
In the second chapter, I looked at the ways in which queer game creators actively resisted the commodification of their identities. And I did this by using the queer games avant-garde as discussed by Bo Ruberg uh, as my main kind of guideline and using that to amass a body of research regarding queer aesthetics. And then in my final chapter, I created my own design framework, which was based on both the findings of my research as well as the act of creating the prototype itself. And that is what I'm mostly going to be talking about today. So what led me to this project is that initially early in the year, I had written an essay which was called What Is It Worth? The Cost of Emotional Free Labor in the Creation of Autobiographical Games. And for this essay, I explored the tension between self-emancipation and self-exploitation for video game creators, and in particular for those who created semi or fully autobiographical works. And as part of this essay, I also looked at two uh, games that I developed for, a, uh, for my games design module at the time. And they were both semi-autobiographical in nature as they explored um, my like personal struggles as a neurodivergent individual, specifically as someone who is autistic and has ADHD. And the first game that I made, which is the one on the bottom, which is called Plan Your Week, which is about uh, balancing your personal and work life by constructing your weekly schedule. But as the game progressed, uh, the amount of tasks increased and the amount of free time decreased. And eventually you were forced to fail the game. The game would quite literally tell you, you cannot you know, succeed. You have to take a break. <laughs> and um, probably very uh, recognizable. And uh, the other game I made, which was called Overstimulated, was about having to complete tasks and focusing on them whilst also managing your sensory needs. And again, in uh, similarity to the first game I made, it was basically impossible to succeed. And kind of the idea behind this was that even if you have you know, the right tools to uh, help you with your disabilities, at the end of the day, a disability can still just be that disabling. And after that essay, I felt there was a lot more to explore regarding the issues of labor in the games industry, as well as this you know, process of, of creating something that was autobiographical, which is what led me to my dissertation project. And for this project, I ended up creating my own design framework. And uh, to start with that, I uh, used design pillars, which are a very common uh, thing in games design. And the idea is basically that throughout your entire game design process, you can always refer back to these pillars to kind of understand the core of your game. Uh, so that if at any point you're adding a new mechanic, you're adding a new story element, it has to be in line what is on screen there. So through my research, one of the main things that came forward uh, for the queer games avant-garde is that everything is about resistance. It's about like subverting expectations, which is why I placed that on the top of my design pillars that everything had to in some way be transformative, counterintuitive um, to what maybe people's expectations would be. Then I had three other pillars, which you can see below, which were you know, supporting that aspect of um, uh, reversing, uh, rever uh, uh, subverting expectations. Um, the first one was about reflection because I found that if the player were to understand what they were playing, like how that was going to be subverted, they would need to have the space to reflect upon that. So throughout my design process, I incorporated kind of very specific pause points that the player would be forced to kind of reckon with what did I just play, what did I just read, and to give them a moment to really process this. Then the second pillar I had was joy because I found that through my research, a lot of works around specifically you know, queer identity, um, it's very much focused on the struggles and, and hardships. And that's a completely uh, a valid and very useful uh, thing to research, but kind of as also a challenge to myself and, and kind of wanting to you know, kick back screaming to the world that I exist and I'm happy to exist the way I am. I wanted this project to be something positive, that I wanted to look at this and force myself to view about what made my identity a, a good thing for me. And then the last part was self-harmony in that I wanted throughout the entire game that the player would feel more and more connected with themselves. In the game, 
uh, as you will see uh, later, you drive a car. That's kind of like literally your vehicle for this world. And I wanted those two things to feel more interconnected as the rest and the world would become more different from each other. Kind of emphasizing this point of like, it's not about trying to fit in, it's about finding you know, the balance within yourself. So then to kind of figure out how to translate these experience into a game, I created um, this kind of little design tool where I just collected a long list of personal experience I had that I felt were somehow positively connected to, to my uh, identity as a queer and a trans person. I then tried to uh, figure out a core essence, which was usually about specifically emotion. How made it? How did it make me, you know, feel in that moment? And to then think about how could I translate that feeling into a game mechanic? And then the final stage was to figure out how I could make that fully tangible uh, in the game. Uh, and I'll show you some some um, some examples later. But first, I would like. Oh yeah, so, yeah, sorry. So uh, I'm gonna talk a bit more about the game first. So because the whole idea of this game was about subverting expectations, I started the game as kind of a very basic racing game. It's a very, you know, race games are very much popular uh, among like uh, white cis male straight um, men. Um, and therefore I wanted to take that concept and change it into something else. So unfortunately, I'm missing the right images, but that's fine. <laughs> um, but the idea was that you start on this racetrack and you have to, you know, drive. Sure, that's what you expect. But as you actually finish the race, the game simply continues you to keep on going, like this endless time loop of just doing the same thing over and over. And then it isn't until you physically drive through the wall and break through it that you get to the actual part of the game. And in the main game, what you actually do is you pick up several of my friends and you have conversations with them. <laughs> and they're all conversations that I've had with them about, you know, our identities as, as queer people, about um, several, several aspects of that. And between um, each time that you pick someone new up, the game would slightly change. The car would drive differently or you'd have to follow different road rules. It would, you know, every time the game would, would, would change. And a big part of this was that at the end was, which I was talking about earlier, the kind of reward stage is that once you've you know, dropped everyone off, you go clean out your car because they left a bunch of rubbish because they're great friends. And you find pieces that were direct pieces of my life. This was a, a picture that my uh, girlfriend took. And I you know, wrote a little bit about like, this was specifically about my relationship with generals the moment I entered a queer relationship and what that meant for me. I had a different journal excerpt that was about a music video I participated in about toxic masculinity. Um, there was another one that was just a screenshot of a conversation I had with one of my close friends about you know, how our sexualities and gender intersect with each other. And these were pieces that people would quite literally find in the game, pieces of myself. So now is a little exercise. Uh, I want all of you to do what we I have basically. Time, if then. we have the time. Um, if not, we'll it would be it. good to finish in about five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Can we do? Yeah. Um, we just, yeah, we thought it would have been interesting. We have plans for, for people to reflect. Maybe we can just do it a short version. Yeah. Basically, in front of you, there is a, a mini version of Xander's template. Uh, and it's an exercise in games design, uh, autobiographic games design, uh, particularly queer joy autobiographic games design, which invites you to reflect uh, on uh, an experience that positive impacted you, either a quotidian one or a um uh, a one off uh, and then translate it into a feeling uh, that doesn't mean to have a, a culturally codified feeling joy sadness blah, blah, but rather also bodily experience and then think of a digital game mechanic uh, it's easy to think of that in terms of verbs so for example jumping uh, uh, or uh, um, collecting uh, or uh, uh, traversing 
that trans that could translate in relation to a context and an object that experience. Basically, the framework provides a, a sort of like I don't want to steal it, but like you know, the words, but a sort of like journaling that translates experiences into mechanics. This is all Xander work. I did it. I'm just trying to speed up the because of my lengthy presentation. Can you just tell people online they have been sent this? So yeah, everyone can... has been sent a, 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 a version, a digital day. version of this. So if you want to grab a, a couple of pens and spend two minutes, uh, I know it's very condensed, but, but you got pens, sure. Uh, taking this exercise and then maybe we can just reconvene with any questions that you have about it so, um yeah the final uh, stage of that can you just explain again the experience so, so it's well standard <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the idea is to simply take an experience you've had a positive one that feels you know somehow is meaningful towards your identity um and yeah, just to try to describe that, it can be something maybe you do every day, something like a personal ritual. It could be a specific moment you've had with a friend or relative that made you go, wow, that made me feel like myself. That's kind of what we're looking for. One off experience. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Not, not a, like a general thing. No, or really. it could be whichever. Um, so for Xander was every day, uh, Xander walks the dog and feels grounded in a routine that yeah. makes her feel herself, uh, himself and, and, uh, um, and uh, yeah. What's the mechanics? Um, whenever, yeah. I said I don't. <laughs> You don't really get things anyways. It seems to the room with the perceived I I don't or an object. Can you go to the last two because that's one. Yeah, yeah. I mean I was wait, is everyone have one for the first one? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, okay, then that's fine. Yeah. So where are we on now? Three, four, five. Oh, oh. Right, yeah. So the third step is the idea that you could try to think of in this game, in the sense how to translate it into a game. Like there's a lot of very basic things like jumping, collecting, solving, like the examples on the screen. But I guess what helps maybe to think about it is what is the context maybe of the feeling? Um, is there a certain item that you could relate to this feeling? Is there something that can kind of give this a bit more tangible in that sense? So in Xander's example, uh, the experience of walking the dog, which is daily and it's sort of like both busy but leaves space for thoughts, can translate in driving a car and uh, having uh, uh, that kind of presentness to the activity, but also the mind and emotional space to. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it doesn't need to be a literal translation of that event, but rather something simpler to design on a digital object. It could be a little. Yeah, yeah, I guess it could be. Yeah. <laughs> we want to move to the next one. Yeah. Just the stage. So then the final stage of this would be to think of, you know, how you could symbolize this. The examples I was giving, I, I had a picture of myself. I had a screenshot of a conversation. I had a music video that I was in. Is there something? You know, very tangible, almost like it would be a journaling page that you could connect to this experience that you've had. An artifact, a moment, a picture, a sentence.
while you guys do this, uh, I, I should stress that uh, Zander is very modest. Uh, Zander won the Dean Prize for Innovation in MA Dissertations. Uh, uh, Brunel, uh, as I said, emerging uh, game designer. What is particular about this project is not just uh, exposing the vulnerability of one's um, identity through autobiographical games, but I find quite brave in that this vulnerability to look for queer joy, which is in queer theory something that is often understated and underlooked, uh, something that can be again close to Munoz's ideas of queer utopia, seeking like seeking like these spaces out of time, queering even history if one has to, to reclaim desire and joy in queer bodies and identities. And I think this is really what the framework tries to mobilize, forcing or enabling people to reach that utopic space that is not always afforded in the physical proximity or realities of the of the subject, of the queer subject. So we've got a couple of minutes and then yeah, yeah. I there won't be space for any questions. Yeah, I only have a couple of slides, so if everyone yeah, has yeah, something, yeah. um, what do you want to do? Just do you want to take some examples or? No, I think it's like I think we can just yeah wrap okay. it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now a little bit of reflection on this project because it has been two years for me uh, since I did this, and in all honesty, I also hadn't looked at it in about two years. Um, but what? really um, stuck with me is that whilst at the time uh, when I was deep in the trenches of just trying to hit a deadline, I think uh, now looking back on it, it really afforded me a space to, I think, you know, I did successfully push myself to look beyond the ways that I was maybe struggling, the way that I felt confined uh, within what my, you know, body allowed me to be. And instead, I, I looked at how specifically other people, how kind of community, how other people who did love me and who did care for me for the way that I am uh, made me feel and, and how that was important. And I think that was something I found very transformative by by doing this. And, you know, as I was saying, it, it requires a very deep vulnerability. It's, it's quite awkward having to send your lecturers a, you know, entire spreadsheet where it's like, yeah, I'm talking about some things that you probably don't want to know about. Um, <laughs> but you Less to do... awkward to this audience, probably, <laughs> but, but for games designer, um, it is quite... Un... And, you know, specifically now with the point that this is somewhat a published work, it's, it's, it's on my website as I'm, you know, uh, presenting these things. And um, I, I thought it was a really good exercise. And I think that for doing this, I, I do genuinely believe that is maybe some kind of way to mobilize this for, for, for other people to use. I think that was always kind of the goal is to have, find a way for, you know, to kind of give back to the community in a sense, because I felt like that is what got me through these things. And maybe this is a tool that members of my community can then use to give back to themselves and give back to other people. But the last point that was kind of interesting to me, and I only really realized this whilst I was talking to Ivan about this presentation, is that I kept aspects of myself very separate in doing this. This was purely focused on, on queerness and on queer theory, whereas the other two autobiographical games that I talked about were only focused on you know, my, my neurodiversity. And I think now looking back on it, it's kind of, for me, it feels to say that you cannot separate my queerness from my neurodiversity. They inform each other in ways that I wish I would have explored at the time. And it's something that I'm looking forward to explore now because I think there's a lot of potential in understanding how these things uh, intersect. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. just to Dominic. Apologies for that. That's okay. Handing to Dominic because we don't have much time. So Dominic, uh, do you want to think how how you want to use it? I, well, I mean, I don't, to be fair, I think we've had some really sort of power, as I said, sort of powerful themes emerging um, and each with a very different kind of take or perspective, um, moving from the body and emotionality and trans into incarceration, 
um, you know, some of the issues around how queer people are marginalised, to thinking about what what happens in kind of mainstream popular um, sort of digital game culture. So, you know, in a way, I felt uh, I feel sort of very honoured to be, you know, sort of invited into this space as a sort of non queer person. And so I'm, I'm sort of really respectful, but also, um, you know, pleased that I found found a place at the end of it, if you sort of mean. Um, but um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know how other people feel or what do people have comments or they've only got a few minutes. But it'd be great to get some uh, some some sort of feed feedback. OK, you want to read some of the comments out there, Dominic, because they're far away for us. Yeah, let me just see if I can find them. Hang on. So here we are. Here we are, chat. OK, um, oh, actually, one of the things that did come to my mind is I thought it would be good to kind of get a resource pack together. Somebody mentioned about a um, sort of psychoeducation. And I'm a bit of a sort of practical person. I'm thinking, well, how can we can, how can we sort of disseminate and engage others with these really powerful kind of talks? And I'm thinking it would actually be quite good to have some resources that were kind of accessible um for you know to sort of begin to queer normativity you know, sort of be i think there's a that's a thing um so if we if we can yeah if we, it'd be good to you know for the speakers and people who are present if we if i could if we can invite you to at least offer one text or one thing um you know we'll be in touch shortly but if you can you give us something that you thought would be of help particularly to clinicians but also beyond um in terms of engaging and understanding and being with LGBTQAI plus, um, you know, people, um, that'd be that'd be great. But um, yeah, I guess I guess the last thing maybe because we do only have one minute left is just to thank everybody uh, and really, you know, the participants, the speakers, Jenny for being so brilliant and hosting and organising, Senna who's not here but she also does do a lot of organisation um, in the background, sort of the administration and so forth. But also it's funded by Brunel University. Um, it's hosted today in CNWL NHS Foundation Trust. The NHS is very much supportive of this kind of, you know, of our work. Um, and I do feel like there's a kind of project here that's important to establish. So thank you all for, all for contributing to that. Um, it's it's a really important piece of work and I hope it'll have ripple effect. So yeah, thank you for, thank you for coming. And once again, thank you to speakers. We can have a big round of applause for all the speakers. I thought it was just brilliant. Really, really good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this last comment's lovely. If I can just, uh, I can't fully see it without my glasses, but it just says I can read here everything I'd hope from from the event. So thank you again to the presenters for covering such a diverse, uh, yeah, range of things in one short evening. My mind is literally wanting to go out and dance and process. <laughs> um, but there, but do you want to say something about the next event, Dominic, just so that people are aware of uh, what our plan is, because we're going to have a little gap. Usually we run them yeah. on the third Tuesday of every month. Sorry. I'm, I'm yeah, OK, so, so, so <laughs> essentially it's bringing together students and um, staff from the Brunel Art Psychotherapy program. Um, there'll be like there'll be a live event, like a visual event that takes place. But it's about yeah emerging pedagogies in, in art psychotherapy and how we begin to be a bit more inclusive and sensitive and thoughtful about the kind of wider context and how this how this informs good teaching practice, essentially. Um, so, and Alice is, is sort of helping to or organising this, leading and organising this, um, but you'll hear more about that very shortly. So it's really Yes, everybody will get an email. Everybody who's on the list will get an email. And thank you very much. Thank you to everybody online. Thank you to everybody here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank <laughs> you. Big applause for Jenny. Well done. Yay. <laughs> yes, we've